everyone. Welcome to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, best-selling author and senior director of valuation services at CFGI, where I help my clients determine the value of their most important assets. If you'd like to learn more about me or have a conversation, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. In my world, business performance and business value is measured by the numbers, uh, but savvy leaders understand that there's usually more to the story. So welcome to the program where you dig deeper to understand what really matters most in business. Today we're going to be talking about entrepreneurship with my guest Carly Meyer Bentley, who is Vice President and Senior Director at, oh boy, sorry, Wilmington Trust. <laughs> I botched that one, but I can't remember. No right. problem. Sorry, Carly. No problem. How welcome, are you? Welcome to Behind the Numbers. Thank you. Thank tell, you for tell, having me here. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about who you are, since sure. obviously I can't. <laughs> sure. So um, I have a, a, a checkered uh, career that's led me to this point, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much, by the way. Um, I have, was raised in an entrepreneur household. Uh, it was clear to me that, uh, you know, to make your own way in my family, you, you know, bootstrapped it up, and, and I went into finance very early. And I've had a, a fantastic career in lending money, um, starting up banks, um, taking banks public, and so forth. And one of the things that I enjoy most is working with entrepreneurs. So I manage money. Um, I try to help them grow their businesses, preserve the assets that they have well into legacy, and then help them uh, with seed funding for new startup companies. Yeah, you just touched on it briefly, but I want to just unpack it a little bit further to understand your why, so to speak. Mm -hmm. What is it about the entrepreneur that really inspired you to take this dive? I would say the uh, undying desire to be better and start and create new opportunity. There's something about entrepreneurs that is relentless um, in their pursuit to accomplish. So I have this fascination with the entrepreneur's psychology and how they can produce and create opportunity for themselves and other people. Yeah, let's talk about the entrepreneur as a part of a larger ecosystem. I think you have referred to it in something that you've written that I've read recently as a, a kind of a startup community. Sure. Talk a little bit about what that is and, and why is that important? Sure. So I think when small companies start, they need a group of situations that will help them become successful. And it, an entrepreneur by themselves usually is great, but when you can have a community of people around them to inspire and encourage and use resources and help plan, leveraging assets, they can be very successful. And what happens uh, ultimately is your local economy grows. So if you're investing in an entrepreneur, whether it be time and resource or government assistance, um, nine times out of 10, the local economy becomes stronger. So I think that's, that's what the community piece is all about. It's bringing all those things together for the entrepreneur. Yeah, so when you talk about the, the local community and funding and so forth, wh where does an entrepreneur turn for funding? Is it, is it a traditional bank or maybe That's not so a really much? good question. So there's many methods that entrepreneurs will go through to find, but I think the most important place for an entrepreneur to start is at a bank. Usually bankers will know. Uh, angel investors or other um, programs that are going on in the, the community that will help them. Um, early on in my career, I realized that I needed to have other sources of funding besides lending. And it takes a couple of years before banks are comfortable lending to startups. So I generally like to start with organizations in counties that are connected to the municipality um, to help them with programming. Yeah, how important is it for an entrepreneur to take, and this is kind of a dumb question, but how, how, how long, how important is it for an entrepreneur to take a more of a holistic approach in thinking about their total portfolio of assets, so to speak, because a lot of them just think about their business as their main asset. And I know you're in money management, I know you've got some boundaries you're not allowed to, to walk through or over here, so I want to have you tread lightly and carefully, but speak to that that overall asset allocation in a high level, if you will, and I'll, I guess I'll throw my two cents in as an entree. That's great. Because when most investors are thinking about a diversified portfolio, they think about you know asset allocation and it's large cap, mid cap, small cap bonds, etc. But with business owners and entrepreneurs, when you layer in that ownership interest in their privately held business, 
it skews the whole asset allocation way too heavily towards that particular business. So from the standpoint of what you're, you're able to share and, and not cross any boundaries, can you speak to that construct? I would love to. I think that is where the magic is for me. Um, when an entrepreneur, most of what, most of the money that entrepreneurs make, they put back into their companies. I think what's really important is thinking about the end game. A lot of, a lot of my clients or entrepreneurs think about the sale of their company. Um, so as they're having liquidity events, as their businesses are are growing, they're taking some of those chips off the table. They're reallocating it in other investments should it be to preserve in fixed income and other stocks uh, and other strategies but that business is is really the bulk of their of their net worth so planning is a big component of do I want to hold this company do I want it to, to send it into the into the legacy into the family business do I want to sell so having that end game really even if it's foggy to have some kind of end game planned so that you can put yourself in the right place you mentioned about the psychology of the entrepreneur I want to explore that with you just a little bit sure. I'd like you trying to uh, explain to me the and to the audience the psychology of an entrepreneur as opposed to an individual who believes that they possess an entrepreneurial spirit okay so I I don't I am NOT an entrepreneur per se but I am fascinated by entrepreneurs entrepreneurs are different so I, I can speak to that specifically there's a couple of entrepreneurs in the Princeton area that I had the privilege to, of working with where everything in an analytical place was telling them not to pursue an opportunity but they believe wholeheartedly in what they're doing and can see and have this vision into bringing this opportunity to fruition all the statistics prove otherwise all of all of the the best partners are telling them not to do something but yet they move forward towards that so they're not fearful there's a lack of fear a total vision and they go for it. That's the biggest difference. It's inside them. It's not anything that you can tangibly measure, if that makes sense. Oh, totally. I, I get it. It's definitely an intangible quality for sure. Uh, Carly, for the, uh, the folks who are watching and listening, if they'd like to learn more about you and how to contact you, how can they do that? You can do that by calling me on my cell phone, 215-460-7248. Uh, my email address is carlymeyerbentley at outlook.com. So we only have just a couple of minutes left in this first segment. So I just want to stay on this, this concept about the entrepreneur uh, as we head into the break. In your experience, are, are there key things that entrepreneurs ought to be aware of, high level, granular level, your choice in terms of their businesses, where they go wrong? What are the biggest mistakes that they're making? So I will stay high level because each business is different. Each entrepreneur is different. Uh, the, I like to, to have the entrepreneur um, prepare a solid plan before you go in asking for seed money or investor money or even a loan it's very important that you have your plan put in place almost to the point of ex exit strategy so that the investors or lenders uh, can feel confident in your numbers that you're going to do what you say you're going to do so high level I like it all begins in the planning process fair enough I think we have to go to a commercial break here, so let's sit tight and we're going to take a quick break here and we'll be right back on Behind the Numbers with Carly Meyer Bentley. cook or just want to eat like one, visit Rostelli Market Fresh, your home for the freshest locally sourced ingredients to please everyone who loves great food. Our organic meats, quality seafood, and free range poultry are cut fresh to order. Chefs create culinary inspired prep foods made fresh every day, which pair nicely with our vast selection of fine wines and spirits. Choose from handmade pastas, artisan cheeses, organic produce, and grocery items, all from the finest purveyors. Rostelli Market Fresh, from our family to yours. RVN TV is a platform for people of any industry to share their story. Over 285,000 viewers are tuning in to RVN TV shows monthly. We guarantee a great experience that you'll be sharing with everyone you know while increasing your personal and company's brand awareness. But what is your brand? According to Forbes, it's a combination of your logo, your product, your design and feel, and your personality. Did you know that aside from being a guest, 
we offer even more opportunity to boost your brand. Adding your company logo and website on screen during your interview will allow viewers to recognize your brand instantly. Incorporating images and video clips is another great way to showcase your product during your live segment. Let viewers see how good you really are. And most importantly, there's you and your interview. For less than the cost of a newspaper, direct mail, or a magazine ad, you can leave our studio and within 48 hours, have a permanent digital copy of your live segment to link to your social media, embed into your company website, or use in email marketing. Investing in your brand is so very important, and we can't wait to have you as a guest. Shelter dogs aren't broken. They've simply experienced more life. If they were human, we would call them wise. They would be the ones with tales to tell and stories to write. The ones dealt a bad hand who responded with courage. Do not pity a shelter dog. Adopt one. Welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and today we're talking with Carly Meyer Bentley, who's a vice president at Wilmington Trust. And we're talking about entrepreneurship and funding entrepreneurship and funding local communities. Um, I wanted to start this, this segment kind of dovetailing on some of the things we talked about earlier. Uh, let's just start briefly with local community investment. Uh, why, why is that important from your lens? Sure. So, so if we take it grassroots, the important thing to remember uh, there was a study done by Civic uh, Economics, a small group. Um, what they did is took $100 spent at a big box store, only gave the community $13 back into their um, their community, whether it be you know marketing a local company that they're doing business with. If you were to buy a product from a local store, $47 goes back into that economy. So I think what's important to remember is supporting your local entrepreneurs also supports the local economy that you live in, which also supports your community. So it's that triple bottom line that people like to refer to. Yeah, and we were talking at the break about involving academic institutions. Where, where do they fit into oh this? Oh my gosh, concept? they're integral in launching the entrepreneur. If you have academic assets, um, big institutions, organizations, universities, Princeton, Westchester University, Penn State, those kinds of places, have programs to help entrepreneurs launch. There's also government programs, tax credits that Pennsylvania gives uh, startups so that they can be successful. And what it does is that dollar multiplier effect in our local economies. So using those springboards are really important in, in trajectory for local economies. Yeah, so for those watching and listening, Carly is also a senior pri private client advisor at Wilmington Trust and then that when she wears that hat, she's managing money for her clients. And you're not allowed to talk about a lot of that kind of stuff, and I, I get that and respect that, but I wanted to make sure the audience understands what you do in, in your day job, so to speak. So again, in that the day job mindset with now crossing many lines, uh, let's talk a little bit about valuation of the business in, in an entrepreneurial situation. Uh, a lot of business owners think that valuation is the be-all, end-all, and you know, in my world, that's certainly a very important thing. But when you think about the wealth management component, it's not necessarily always the overall value of the business that matters in the transaction. What matters more might be how you allocate those proceeds going forward and what do you do with the rest of your life. So there's a lot in that statement. I ask you to address that wherever you can. Sure. Sure, so um, taking the entrepreneur at grassroots because there are stories and clients that I have now that I've brought in at grassroots when they had nothing and just started and it was a dollar and a dream and they've built these flourishing companies and have done really well. During certain times in the economy, like the recession, there were times when they had to take some of those chips off the table and be smart. The stomach ache component, that gut check of am I taking enough out of my business, am I investing enough in my business is a very healthy balance. It's a, it has to be a healthy balance. So as these businesses are evolving, I help clients then grow and take the money, the earnings that they're getting from their companies, whether it is through a sale or a divestiture of some sort, and help 
preserve that capital that they've worked so hard to build. So first, if with the entrepreneur, it's about making it, and then it's, oh my goodness, don't let me lose it. So it's a totally different side of the coin, but equally important. Are all entrepreneurial entrepreneurs serial entrepreneurs? Do they, in your experience, do they always go on to the next thing after exiting their, their first love, so Nine times out of 10, yes. There, there's, if they're selling a company, they already have an idea of the next chapter. Even some of the folks that have been in business 40 plus years, retirement is not in their, their purview. It's yeah. more about what the next chapter is or what, how can I give to the, to the next generation of entrepreneurs? That's a big thing that's going on right now for me and my clients. Yeah, entrepreneurs are certainly wired differently. And we talked a little bit about in the first segment the, the psychological difference between an entrepreneur and a traditional employee. But let's talk about one entrepreneur versus another. What makes the great ones great? I've seen many, small, medium, and big size. I'd have to say it's that unrelenting desire to win uh, in the face of people telling them no. It's they just continue to say yes. They use resources. They're not afraid to ask for help. Um, they're not afraid to. They're not afraid to do the ask. Um, I would say that that's that's those are the qualities of the of the great ones is not quitting, um, even in the face of people telling them no. What kind of resources are available to entrepreneurs who maybe have a great idea, maybe have a, a technical background around a product or a service, but maybe they're not so-called business people. Maybe they're not sales oriented. Uh, what kind of resources have you seen or would you recommend for the folks who are watching and listening? I can recommend a couple right now that I've personally been involved with. Uh, I sit on the board of I2N, which is the uh, Econ Chester County's Economic Development Council. Um, that's a place, it's a conduit for connection between investors and um, opportunity. So there we have this, all those things we mentioned, academic asset leverage, we have municipal help, we have guidance, mentorship available. Uh, I know Princeton also has that. The Princeton Merchants Association also offers that along with Princeton University. So there are um, organizations and partnerships in communities that can help entrepreneurs. So give me a call and I'll help you. Good segue, how can people reach you to do that? Yeah, so call me, 215-460-7248. Uh, email address is carlymeyerbentley at outlook.com. So we talked a little bit about the psychology of an entrepreneur, but before we went on the air, we were talking a little bit about a couple other components, a technical component and a social component. Can you speak to those for the audience, Carly? The technical component and the social component of, say that again. Of entrepreneurship. Yeah, so, so the social component of, the technical piece of entrepreneurship to me, um, you need your tools, you need the technology. I, I, could you ask a more specific question to that? Yeah, maybe I'm just botching that, but in, in the, <laughs> maybe, but you know what, maybe we should just move on to a, a different topic then. Let's move back into the, the entrepreneurial communities and this network society that we live in. Uh, in. In terms of the entrepreneurial community, is there a camaraderie among entrepreneurs? Are they working collaboratively? Yes, Are they absolutely. competitive? How does that play? I would say a true entrepreneur will collaborate with anybody that's in, in their space. What they've found is in that collaboration, they can build better and stronger companies. Um, the partnership also helps them help each other uh, flourish. So for example, a local company like a restaurant here will help a school in their collaboration for whatever um, students are graduating that are in that space. Um, so I would say entrepreneurs are very apt to help each other, even in a competitive environment. They want to see each other succeed. I think it's part of the dynamic and the dance. Yeah, and that's probably part of that social component in, gotcha. in terms of the way they play together nicely in the sandbox. Yeah. Um, so everybody's seen Shark Tank. Uh, I think they're coming up to their 11th season. I know I get phone calls from people around the world based on an article that I had written a few years ago about Shark Tank. And that kind of sets a stage for what an entrepreneurial pitch might look like. What's your experience in working with entrepreneurs when they're pitching investors? And are you able to juxtapose that to the Shark Tank experience? Yes. Yeah, so what I, I love Shark Tank myself. And we've done some things in, in Princeton specifically, and we're getting ready to do them in Chester County, something like Shark Tank, where investors will be pitching, or I'm sorry, um, entrepreneurs will be in, pitching to investors their ideas. 
the biggest piece of advice I can give any entrepreneur is to keep that zeal contained within the plan. There is nothing worse than an entrepreneur pitching their business idea to an investor and not being prepared, not having statistics, not having any information to back what they're trying to get seed money for. So um, I think that's very, that's the most important part, I believe. How does an entrepreneur know when it's time to start bringing in other people on the team? That's a great question. When you are an entrepreneur, it's good to have many partners. I think it's important to tap on those partners and ask them financially if your business is, is mature enough to take on. Um, sometimes having one or two people and keeping your overhead low is really important until you're at the point where it makes sense to take on additional employees. Yeah, so I, I know from personal experience, sometimes those first early hires are, are not the best ones because entrepreneurs maybe are more inclined to bring in people who are, in their view, like them or their friends or, in a lot of cases, family members. What advice would you offer an entrepreneur that's contemplating expanding the business and bringing in some additional employees? That's a great, that's a great um, thing to bring up. The, the thing I learn most about entrepreneurs is they're very good at whatever their widget is. And sometimes not having the business acumen behind them to make smart decisions or choices that will put their business in a growth trajectory. You have to have your team of people. You have to have your, your accountant. You have to have your attorney. You have to have that mentor, that person that really has your best interest in mind. Um, to, to be a second set of eyes for you so that you're not in this thing alone. That's the best advice I can give. Yeah, recognize that you don't know what you don't know or recognize certainly what you don't know for sure. And you talk about assembling a team and I, I do personally believe that that's critical. You've gotta have the right board of directors, if you will, and I use that term in air quotes because we're talking about the accountant, we're talking about the attorney. And a lot of times in the spirit of hiring friends and family, uh, entrepreneurs may hire their brother-in-law who's a personal injury attorney and now that uh, personal injury attorney is handed a business document that may be out of their everyday wheelhouse. How important is it to identify the right fit players and, and what are the characteristics? Every decision that you make as an entrepreneur will either enhance your opportunity or detract from it. If you're picking the wrong people on your team, your success rates go down. It's already hard enough for an entrepreneur's business to, to go forward and flourish. If you have a contract to review, get a contract lawyer. Make sure you're not hiring family. Family is nice, friends are nice, but when you're hiring someone as a business partner, it's, it takes away that um, component. It gives a level of a, a, a piece of separation that just makes things more accurate. Yeah, we only have a couple of minutes left to go in the program, but for the folks who are watching and listening, Carly, who believe that they have that entrepreneurial itch, and maybe they have an idea, or maybe they've been tinkering with a product, what's a good next step for them to, to vet that and whether they can really determine if it, they've got I'd something I'd love them viable. to call me. I would love to help them. So you could email me, Carly Meyer Bentley at Outlook.com. I also think you can go to your local, local municipality. There should be some community organization, chamber of commerce, those kinds of groups can, can at least bring you to the people that can get, can get you the answers and tell you what you need to do. Yeah, you talked a bit about the entrepreneur needs to really understand their business, understand their numbers. Uh, I, I can't tell you and, and the audience enough how important the numbers are in terms of raising capital, selling your business, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, unfortunately, again, early stage, they don't necessarily buy in to bringing on, the, we'll call it the proper advisors. What's your advice for the entrepreneur who's doing the balancing act between trying to put together the right team and recognizing that maybe they just don't have the ability to pay at that particular point in time to bring in the folk that they would ideally want to? So I appreciate that question. There's a small startup um, that did bring itself to sale. It's at the point now where its valuation is, is ready. And um, this particular individual is afraid to spend the money to have these things done, these services. I think some of the psychological components we talked about, there's some apprehension of her actually selling her company. but what she's realized is that she does have to spend the money, but there are people that can, that will do, will, will take on an interest. So 
I think when you when you have a good connection with someone, when you have good relationships with people, people will do things for you because they want to see you succeed. So there are good people out there that will will work with uh, individuals to give them what they need, and you know until they're totally mature and able to afford all these things, people can work with you. Yeah. Why is it entrepreneurs sell? You mentioned earlier that you know, generally speaking, they're on to the next thing, and, and retirement's not in their in their long-term view. Why do they sell? So humans just have this urge to start things. We love to start things. It's in us. Our communities were built by somebody having an idea, and it kind of people jump on that bandwagon and they help create this thing. Entrepreneurs in their spirit like to create. Mm-hmm. So when they sell, they're already thinking about the next idea. I think it's just in them. Yeah, it is. It's just in them. And on that note, we've got a wrap, Carly. I want to thank you for joining me. Today, we've been talking about entrepreneurship and all the nuances that go into that with Carly Meyer Bentley, who is a vice president at Wilmington Trust. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and I'll see you next time on Behind the Numbers.